recently of, uh, oh. That's the theme music, yeah. apparently, that we've got prepared for. Uh, recently founded a company, Persea. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Close enough? Close enough, Okay. Yeah. He'll say it many a time. Uh, and he'll tell you about that. Uh, and and uh, Dina, who is with Paramount Home Video, uh, and is S and D of Worldwide Media Marketing. A little feedback through here. This is not very good. Um, I was too close to you. Should I leave it to you? Good morning, everyone. How is everyone? I have to thank. Uh, where's the Canto guy? Canto guys? Are they? Yeah, I can't see. I don't know which one of you tagged me in the in the run photograph this morning, but it makes it look like I did the run this morning. So <laughs> social media is under the impression I ran 5K this morning. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I did not, evidently. Um, OK, so we've got a um, short presentation. Uh, Dina's going to tell you what she thinks. I'm going to tell you what I think. Um, and then we're going to kick the day off. Um, and that's about it. I mean, there's going to be lots of great content. There's two really important fireside chats. Full disclaimer, no fire. Um, hopefully, we'll get the warmth without the fire. We're going to have the two Allens. Uh, where are the two Allens? Can I, can I, I? OK, one Allen's there. Another Allen? OK, we're going to have the two Allens. We've only got one Allen right now. Um, and, then, and then tomorrow, um, we're going to mention this pretty much every time I get. Uh, Bill Koningsberg, CEO of Horizon, chairman of Horizon Media, the largest privately owned media agency. Uh, in the world, one of, one of the titans of the media agency world is going to be here, and it's going to be our final session. And that is such an incentive for you guys to stick around. Plus, we'll be locking the doors, so you can't actually leave early. Um, that's the plan for tomorrow, but I think it's time for Dina to tell you yeah. what she thinks about stuff. Hi, everyone. It has been said that our business will change more in the next five years than it has in the last 50. In fact, our business is changing before our eyes. Every day, every hour, every minute. We could all speculate as to where this is going in the next five years, year, or even the next few months. But the truth is that nobody really knows. We could all contemplate how our jobs will be changing down the road. We only know what we have today. And what we have today are some challenges, but also some opportunities. Never before has the mix of the quantitative with the rise of the big data and qualitative been so integrated. This has created so many opportunities for us as marketers to test and to retest, to learn and to refine. We know there's never been a better time to make inexpensive marketing content with the plethora of devices that we have today at our fingertips. But most of you tell me that you've also been spending more and more money on content creation as the demand for this grows in the marketplace at an unprecedented rate. We also know that programmatic media buying offers a sophisticated way to target audiences online. But sometimes when all is said and done, we really don't know how cheap that media inventory really was, or how much more we had to worry about the pervasive problems of fraud and viewability that continue to plague our industry today. For all intents and purposes, the world of digital marketing has really only been in existence for about 20 plus years. We know it's getting harder and harder to break through with the way things we've done in the past. Many of us in this room here today are senior managers who have teams that report into us and rely upon us for daily guidance and direction. Yet we also have managers that we report into. Some of these managers have really embraced change and taking risks, and others not so much. We've all had to adapt in ways we've never really imagined. In this constant state of change, one certainty has emerged. It's imperative that we continue to take risks and to try new things in our daily jobs and our overall careers. The late Dr. Leo Bascaglia, a well-known author and beloved professor at USC in the 1960s said it best. He said, to try is to risk failure, but risk must be taken because the greatest hazard of life is to risk nothing. I believe the statement has never been more appropriate in our industry. If we don't adapt as marketers, we'll be left behind. If we fail, we could always try again. If we don't try, we'll never learn and we'll never grow. So maybe it's time to tackle that project at work that you've been dreading for a long time, but you know the payoff could be awesome. 
You know, fortunately, there are some things that I think will never change. A consumer's time will always be his or her most precious resource. And garnering attention in a positive way is always the first step in the process. The quality and the legitim legitimacy of a message will never go out of style. It's simply the methods and the vehicles in which we deliver these messages that are in a frenetic state of change. Whenever you're in doubt about a campaign strategy, always stop and ask yourself, does this really add value? Does it entertain or inform in some way? If it doesn't, it's time to start over. If we're not honest with ourselves about our marketing, it will be reflected in our work. And even worse, your audiences will notice too. So I encourage you over the next couple days to try as much as you can to pay attention, take notes, be inspired, chat with the person next to you, even if he or she doesn't want to talk to you. Maybe the payoff might not come today or tomorrow, but I bet it will come to you and probably in a way that you never expected. And if I could offer you some advice, and I need to take this advice myself, it's try to put your mobile phone down as much as you can and be present in the moment. I guarantee you're gonna walk away from this summit with some knowledge, an idea that you might wanna try back at the office, or at the very least, some validation. Validation that you're not alone, that you're grappling with a lot of the issues that other marketers face today. We're all trying to figure something out, or frankly, we wouldn't be here. Okay. Wonderful, I think you've got the clicker right there. You have the clicker? So we've kind of talked about these points from your, did you want to say any more to these points for you? Yes. So what is the current state of marketing today? Well, I think it's a jungle out there. With so many choices of vendors, solutions, and product offerings, and directions that you could take your marketing in, and let's not forget to add a healthy dose of BS on top of all this that we have to navigate through, no wonder we're more confused than ever before. But never, never fear, in all this chaos comes opportunities. It's time to innovate and test. It's time to come at problems with a fresh perspective. We also talked about the need for risk taking. In an uncertain time like this, great success could be achieved, but there's also more room for failure. But we should look at these failures as ways to get to our ultimate successes. As marketers, I believe we need to give special attention to attention itself. Where are consumers truly spending their time these days? For example, we all know that app consumption is on the rise given the proliferation of devices in the marketplace. But are we really giving the time and energy it deserves as brand marketers? And how are we grabbing their attention? And ultimately, how are we adding value? So there's lots of things we could have talked about today, and we've picked a few topics to drill into. But the first thing I wanted to put in front of you guys is kind of a challenge to say, are we seeing the change we wanted to see? Are we seeing the delivery of what we wanted to see two, three, five, four, five years ago? Because I think that's a very personal point that we can be introspective about, because if we're not, maybe we can point some fingers about that, but we also have to look inward and ask the question of why we're not seeing that change today. So some of the themes that I'm starting to, 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 to link to this notion of, of change and promise, but maybe not fulfillment and delivery, is data. Everyone's drowning in data. It's exponentially increasing. The number of uh, different sources of information are increasing. But I'm hearing consistently across industry from very, very different sources that no one's feeling good about that rise in data. Everyone's drowning in it. They can kind of see the promise in it. So the question to me is, why aren't we thinking more about how we swim through this pile of data? Why aren't we thinking more about how we get value from this? The second thing is something we touched on yesterday for those of you in the panel. It's like, isn't there a way to tell better stories with this data? And I'll drill more on this in, in my slides in a few moments time. But by developing stories and narrative, a construction that Dina knows very well from the movie industry where you actually have to tell a very compelling story else no one's gonna watch your product. If you don't take that same approach to how you do analysis and how you start to use the information, I think you're missing something. Um, and then what I'd really pose as a challenge here is, if anyone here in this room is using a purchase funnel, just go ahead and slap yourself. Because um, purchase funnels are really not very smart. They're very narrow, they're very linear, and their time has come and gone. So I'm gonna be pretty controversial and just did and say, 
Get rid of those purchase funnels. People don't buy in straight lines. There may be very simple transactions between one and two steps, but the reality is now with social media, with the multiple touch points, with the various ways that we can consume information and also transact, the linear purchase funnel is a thing of the past. People are on a very different journey to purchase. And I'm gonna put forward some thoughts around what that might be. So I'll hand back to Dina for a few more slides as she takes you through some of her perspective and some of the awesome work that Paramount have been doing. Okay, so we are drowning in data, um, and all we hear about is content. You know, making good content, consuming good content, and honestly, sometimes I get sick of it. Um, of course, not all content is created equal. Uh, how many of you saw this on Facebook, where you could put your name in, and, and did you share it with people? And anyway, so you put your name in, and, and it comes up with this funny little thing, and you just don't know what's going to come up. And sometimes it's really germane to your life, and sometimes it's not. But um, I loved it so much, and this really doesn't have anything to do with marketing other than the fact that it's like, how do we make content like that that consumers love, but brand marketing, brand message messaging? Um, and I think it is possible given some key points, and um, I'll take you through those now. One thing, I'm sure there's no creative directors that have ever had booze or weed in their office at any point <laughs> in time, so this is obviously not yes. real. I also like the other part of giving vague feedback to his team like something's missing. Okay, um, so what are the rules for content creation? Uh, the more we could uh, make content that resonates on a personal and emotional level, obviously the better. For example, social media has offered us an unprecedented chance to have a one-to-one -one connection with our audiences. Um, it could be your best friend, but it could also be your worst enemy. And there's really no substitute for authentic community management and also using good judgment. Um, there's also, uh, we, could always, we should always be asking consumers how we could help you instead of what we could sell you. Um, I know this sounds counterintuitive, but I think you'll all agree with me. Uh, you know, and there's nothing more powerful than peer-to-peer -peer reviews. Uh, consumers trust reviews from their friends and their family and, and more than anything else nowadays. And Yelp, as we know, is now a well-known established household name. And people even now use it as a verb. I mean, they'll go to a, you know, a car dealership and said, man, I was treated like crap and I'm going to go home and Yelp them. Um, you know, the second point here goes back to value. This is basically, you know, how can we provide long-term value because that's what brand building is all about. And then also, hopefully all this good work will result in a positive image around your brand and then translate to conversions. Okay, um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that we're all strapped for time, talent, and money. So we need to figure out the best way to make use of those resources. We always, um, I know in my business, we always have to do more with less. And so here's an example of how we did more with less. Uh, speaking of doing more with less, the home entertainment industry has had its share of problems in the past decade. Our marketing budgets have gone down drastically, and it's really challenged us to come up with new ways to engage consumers in a cost-effective way. So, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. Um, this was an example of a promotion we did, See Yourself Live in Times Square. Basically, what we asked consumers to do, um, it was the re-release of Titanic on Blu-ray, 3D Blu-ray for the first time. We were trying to engage a whole new generation of millennials that didn't really grow up with the movie and introduce them to the movie. Um, we bought space on a prominent digital board in Times Square, and then we created an, an existing Facebook app and a Twitter integration where you could upload your photo, and then the photo would be snapped of you in Times Square, and then it would be either tweeted back to you or put on your Facebook profile page. Um, you know, thousands of people did this, people got really excited. I just did it with the branding on it just to show you, but um, people were doing Jack and Rose poses and all kinds of things. Um, and so they had that keepsake photo that they would share with their friends, and it really resonated with the younger um, segment of the audience. And then innovation could always take you further. Um, you know, you always have to start with having a big idea. I know we can micro-segment target audiences right now, and it's really great, but I believe we always have to have a common theme and a common goal that threads everything together. I think a lot of times in companies, there's silos that people don't talk to each other, they don't work effectively well together, and so sometimes what you end up having is a lot of fragmented ideas that don't really roll up to the big idea that you could execute against. Um, also, I think we need to adapt the content for each distribution channel that we're in. 
um, making the most of your resources and people, as I talked about, and then also designing content to be meaningful. The goal is always a one-to-one -one personal connection um, and scaling that as much as possible. You know, I think there's good reach, and then I think there's bad reach. Um, and then lastly, hopefully if you've worked hard and you, and you have a message that uh, resonates with your audiences, then um, you'll generate some earned media, again, doing more with less. So generating earned media, um, you know, the, the teenagers in Titanic, the example that I just showed you, they were going on YouTube and making videos and showing their friends, hey, look at me, I'm in Times Square, here's look what I did. They were singing movies, uh, the, the songs from Titanic, and, and, and it was just really amazing to see all the earned media that was generated off of this idea. And then an, an example of innovation is um, last year at the South by Southwest, we timed the digital release of Interstellar, the movie, um, to the South by Southwest Interactive Conference. And we had a traveling virtual reality experience that came off the hills of the very successful theatrical campaign. So what we did here is um, we went to Austin, Texas. We set up a, you know, our publicity team brought the exhibit there. Uh, in case you were wondering, that's me in the photo with the VR headset, so. <laughs> um, but it was really a great experience and it was the perfect target audience. We gave them value uh, and, and then obviously we reminded them gently that you could purchase the Interstellar movie um, on digital download that day. There's a series of Facebook, uh, there's a Facebook album with Where in the World is Dina? And it follows all of her paramount <laughs> marketing activities from Times Square through this and lots there. We had to cut a lot of content out, but you guys should check it out. Sorry all the photos are of me. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dean. That was, that was a great run through of, of some of the, um, uh, the innovative ways you can look at content creation, some of the ways that you at Paramount have done some awesome work. Um, I kind of want to pivot now, and like Josh talks about this as the intersection of content and data. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about measurement. I'm going to talk a little bit about the themes I, I mentioned at the beginning. Um, but, you know, I've tried to, I love memes, and like the most ridiculous memes I could find were um, really not appropriate for a mixed audience, so I had to tone it down a little bit. But this one is just Einstein asking, you know, there's no unit of measure for that level of stupidity. And, and I do believe that the, so much of the measurement conversation is, is descending to this level of, like, what are we measuring? How are we measurement? So my, my section here is measurement, measurement. If we can move to the next. Because I don't know if it's really just about measurement. I think measurement's really important. I know data's really important. We wouldn't be able to do these things if we didn't have those things. But maybe it's about how the data is deployed. And there's a guy uh, who many of you will have heard of called Edward Tufte. He's one of the forefathers of visualization. And he goes around the country selling his books in these conferences. And some of you perhaps sat through it. But man, does he hate PowerPoint. It's like this, he's this little guy that comes on stage, looks like a Princeton professor or a Yale professor, because that's what he was. And then he mentions PowerPoint, and the steam starts to come out of his ears, and the froth starts. So I found this a fantastic meme that made me laugh, because I've seen the guy go nuts over PowerPoint, because every time you make a PowerPoint, Edward Tufte kills a kitten. Um, technically, disclaimer, I don't think he actually kills kitten. I think he just gets angry. Um, but what he has taught me over the years and what he's made me think about is the way you tell the story, the way the information is deployed. And that makes me think it's not just about measurement. If we move to the next slide. But visualization is not just the answer, because there's some really pretty bad visualizations out there. And you see them all over the place. You know, Anything that uses the periodic table of elements and tries to plug an answer into it is a little bit naff, to use an English word. Uh, you see little things like credit crisis visualized with numbers that not explain anything. And this is a good point, because there's always a disconnection between the numbers and the deployment, particularly. And then there's always that weird one about building size and something in Dubai being way bigger than everything else. But there's some, some pitfalls to avoid. And the real lesson here is not to, to pick on these infographics, is to say there has to be a context. There has to be a context between the number the story and what you're trying to present and not just st stick uh, to a, a, a rote idea like a periodic table. So what's the right way to approach it? Um, much longer conversation, just want to introduce this idea to you guys here today. Data is definitely here to stay. There's no question about that. It's just going to exponentially rise. It will be the ultimate resource for strategy. Strategy as a discipline 
be it in an advertising agency or in a strategy consulting firm or on the corporate side, is hugely data dependent. But what we're seeing time and time again is that the, 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 the amount of time that strategy is allowed in order to complete its mission is being reduced and reduced and reduced. And that puts so much pressure on the data analysis stage um, of the strategy development, which I think leaves two opportunities. One is the people. And I think we, we were talking a little bit about this. I remember Nick was talking about it, and Jameson and I were talking about it over drinks last night. It's like hiring the right kind of people. You can find the internally facing guy that can do really cool stuff with numbers, and then you can find the externally facing guy that can talk about the numbers and explain stuff, but God forbid you find the guy that can do both because he's going to want lots and lots of money to work. So there's a real people dimension. And I think as we were talking about last night, the real opportunity is growing those people, developing those people in a way that fits with your infrastructure and what you're trying to decide. And that becomes way more important than any piece of software. And then this is really where I, I kind of drink the, the, uh, the, the Kool-Aid of, of, of Josh's comment, which is creativity and data need to start blending together. There is such an amazing track record of creative development in advertising, creative development in branding, creative development in design, creative development in product development. There's no track record of creative development in data. And that's a huge opportunity. And I think if you can bring together these themes with the right people and the right data infrastructure, that design aesthetic and the creative mindset um, is a huge opportunity. So on the next slide, um, I will start to show you what I think is one of the coolest examples. And I'll show you a couple of examples that I've worked on. This is a guy called Nicholas Felton. Has anyone, a show of hands, anyone heard of Nicholas Felton? Isn't he awesome? He's like, he documents his life in a way, kind of like Edward Tufte, the same kind of concept, where you can see what he's been up to. So we have a super big screen, but at the back, you're probably not going to be able to see this. You know, we, but you can, you can find this very easily on the web. This is Manhattan. These are specific months, I think, even though I can't read them. And then he's broken down his, where he's been, essentially, and what he's done and how he's done it. And on one page, he's explained a year of his life. It's one of his annual reports. You can Google it. And this got me thinking that there is an opportunity to go beyond really grim Tableau reports or really heavy Numero Excel reports, not to throw those things away. They're still valuable and they're still needed because you can't produce something like this until you actually understand the data. But if you can take it further forward, you can start to tell a much more compelling story. If we move to the next slide. So one of the things I worked on in the last year, this was a journey of digital music consumption. And this was an opportunity to look at different segments of users um, and different types of users. And what, I come from a heavy analytic background. So you know, I, I was always a little dubious of creativity or quick strategy without the rigor and the data and the analysis. But what I've found is there's a huge, there's a really central place for advanced analytics, advanced data, and hardcore information to play into a world like this. So what we did here was we went out and did a primary research study, quantitative data, 2,000 respondents, built a unique segmentation, again, using advanced algorithms and analytics to start to understand how people were consuming Data. And instead of putting that in a 100-page PowerPoint deck that would kill the client, we went into a room with this on a huge board. We spent three hours talking about it. We explained the journey in this kind of way. It was, it was like a light bulb moment that data became very accessible. And then we dived into the PowerPoint and the data behind it. The next one, as we wrap up in the last couple of minutes, this was super fun, um, where we worked with a really, really data-heavy wireless subscriber. So for those of you who worked in the wireless industry, they're literally swimming in data. They've got subscriber data. They've got network usage information. You know, they've got it all, right? And they've got third-party data from Experian. They've got all their social media channels. So they think they know everything about data. But what we did is we took a step back and said, well, let's just look at a period of time and the journey that your consumers are on in the holiday period um, and start to figure out if there's some patterns here. And they're like, well, we know what happens in the holiday period. Everyone buys on Black Friday. I'm like, OK, well, let's see what happens. So everyone talks about buying on Black Friday. And it's legitimate. And lots of people do buy on Black Friday. 
and there's a huge spike you can see around Thanksgiving and Black Friday when they're actually doing some activity. And the really interesting thing is the sentiment or the, the motivations completely pivot. And so you get people who've planned ahead and want to get the product they want to the audience here, which is all promotion driven, last minute, got to get the phone I need, got to get the price I need. Do they even have the phone in stock? And what we uncovered for this wireless provider is that they were missing that last mile retail execution, which they figured they were going to take care of earlier in the sequence. And if they hadn't seen this, they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have allowed us to have that conversation because they thought they knew it all from a data perspective. But it wasn't until we said, look at those spikes where you did free shipping. Look what happened. That promo really moved people that were sitting on the fence at the last minute um, right before the Christmas holiday. So if we move to the next slide, there's one key element that I've already touched upon that really can't be underestimated. And this is something that I've figured out over the years. You know, very candidly, I wouldn't have been able to do this work until I found the right guy to help me visualize it. There's not many of those people around, and I think we have to work harder to grow them. But I found a data guy who I work with, and I'm not telling you his name, he's mine, nobody can have him, who could understand what I was saying and what the data was saying, and then starts to create these beautiful visualizations. So the key element, I think, is, is people, because you can't underestimate the power of finding that great team. Um, they may look a little odd, but they are very unique, but they're hard to find. And what I, the conclusion I come to is that we, as an industry, have to take more responsibility of growing those people, not expecting them to land on trees, uh, grow on trees, and then land into the business. Dina. Yeah, and we're just, about, we're just about out of time here, so I think the only thing I would add is that there's a quote I love that many of you have probably have seen, but it's that people don't leave companies, they leave managers. So I think, you know, they said like something like 75% of people when they left their job, it was because of their manager. And so I think that really is sobering for all of us and, and maybe something to keep into perspective. And, you know, even with the rise of all this big data and everything, I think it's easy to get caught up in that and kind of forget about the people. But I think relationships have never been actually more important because of this and because of all the complexities in our business. And, and this is why we're having summits like this. So thank you. Thanks, guys.